Welcome back to the Novice to Noteworthy podcast. This is part two. We are picking up our flop era slash comeback era series. And in this episode, I am talking about knowing when to quit, like the day that I decided I would quit my business. Hey there, are you an entrepreneur looking to start, launch, or grow a podcast? If you said yes, I am so happy you're here. I'm Kristen, a video and podcast producer and CEO of Novice Studios, a production company for podcasters. I help business owners launch and grow their podcasts to serve their audience, build community, and boost sales. I hope you'll subscribe to our show so we can help your show grow from novice to noteworthy. This episode is coming out on Halloween. I wanted to do something a little bit spooky. And so I've got my leaves candle burning from Bath and Body Works and my little skull candle holder. I've got my spooky microphone going. So if you're watching on the YouTube version, you've got like the full spooky vibes, my spooky pillow in the background. We've got a pumpkin over here. Like all the fall things are going on. Um, because quitting is something that is really scary to think about. It's really scary to talk about. Um, it's not something, especially as a high achieving person that we like to even consider as an option for ourselves, but it's actually something that has benefited me greatly. Even just the idea of, is this something that I could let go has been very transformational to me this year as I've transitioned from my flop era to my comeback era. So the first thing that I want to touch on is that this has been a big source of healing for me, learning to recognize when something that I'm holding on to isn't serving me anymore and is maybe even harming me. Um, And the first thing that got me to think about this was processing my birth story. So I gave birth Um, Just over a year ago, my son just turned one, um, and I'm going to share my full official birth story um, over on the Birth Story podcast this winter, which I'm really excited about. But one of the things that Heidi, the host of that show, really stresses is that you don't get an award for an unmedicated birth, and that pushing your body past a certain point can lead to unnecessary suffering and trauma, and that is exactly what I did to myself. Um, and that led to me questioning a lot of things that I've been holding on to just because I felt like it would mean something about me if I then let that thing go. So for me, a big goal of mine was having an unmedicated birth, a natural, in quotations, birth, if you will. Um, and I medicated or I labored unmedicated for five full days, um, And definitely put myself through a lot during that time. Um, I ended up having a C-section because I had labor arrest, which I didn't even know was a thing, um, where you basically just your labor completely stalls and doesn't progress. Um, And so that was really hurting my son. He was having major heart decelerations. Long story short, C-section was the way to go. But... As I was reflecting in my postpartum period, I talked a lot in part one about my mental health struggles postpartum, and in retrospect, I would have gotten the epidural sooner and let my body rest. And I know for a lot of you, you're like, I don't have kids, or I don't want kids, or I've already been through my birth, like, what does this have to do with anything? But I think that there are so many scenarios where we think that the more painful path is going to be the more rewarding path by default. And maybe sometimes it is. Um, Maybe you are training for a race or something where you know that like it's going to be a really difficult journey. You're going to have to put in a lot of hours and a lot of effort and a lot of maybe literal blood, sweat and tears. But at the end, you accomplish this really huge thing that you've always wanted to do and it's totally worth it. But for me in this particular instance, I think it would have saved me from having to do a lot of mental and emotional and physical, a ton of physical healing this year if I had just gotten the epidural and not been so hyper-focused and so attached to this goal emotionally, I think a lot of times we see that as a good thing. It it means you're committed if you don't give up on the goal. Um, Whereas for me, I didn't realize that there was a threshold that I had hit where 
I just needed to let my body have that rest. And on that same kind of thread of motherhood, breastfeeding and nursing was another big example of this for me where I had it in my head that I needed to breastfeed for at least six months. Other moms that I looked up to had done that. Um, That was like a major milestone that I wanted to hit. And I was losing so much sleep of over nursing at night. I was getting up multiple times at night to nurse my son because he was waking up to eat and then pumping during the day. My son was at daycare, so I was pumping uh, during the day while trying to work and manage a demanding schedule. Again, part one, I talked about the craziness of the first half of this year work-wise. So having to juggle that along with pumping, it doesn't seem like it should be a lot. And this is me like (laughs) gaslighting myself about, um, you know, you can do other things while you pump. But like you have these giant things attached to your chest that are literally pumping you like a cow and you're trying to do other things and it's just exhausting. Um, And I kept telling myself that I would be a bad mom if I stopped because that would mean that I didn't reach my goal. It would mean that I wasn't doing everything that I could to breastfeed my son and that's the best thing for him and blah, blah, blah. And somebody that I had, that I trusted and that I still trust had to be like, why is this date so important to you? Like, why are you holding on to this goal so tightly to the point where it is causing you to feel so anxious and depressed? And it really did come down to the comparison and the expectations that I had of myself and the expectations that I felt like other people had of me, Um, like the moms that I follow on social media who were nursing for six months, 18 months. And I thought that if I didn't meet those, then I was giving up on myself to make it work. Um, And that was a really unfair way to talk to myself and to treat myself, especially because if another mom had come to me and told me that they were experiencing all these same things, I would tell them that they are not a bad mom at all for switching to formula, for stopping the nursing journey, for really, you know, giving themselves a break. I would never have that expectation of another mom, but for some reason I was putting that intense pressure on myself. And so I weaned my son off of formula before he hit six months, but my, he was like five months or five and a half months old. So my husband's like, you breastfed for six months. Like we're calling it, you're giving yourself this like arbitrary medal award that you (laughs) wanted to. Um, And literally as soon as I made that decision and started that process, all these things started happening that affirmed that that was the right choice for me and for my son and for our family. Um, He immediately started sleeping all the way through the night, not waking up to eat. I think he wasn't getting enough, like he was getting enough to hit his milestones at his pediatrician visits, but not actually being satisfied. So he started sleeping through the night. He was napping better during the day. He had a much better routine and consistent schedule overall. Literally only good things happened as a result of that decision. And by the way, my son is like a freak of nature when it comes to milestones. He has nine teeth. He started rolling when he was not even two months old. He started um, standing when he was like four months old. He has done everything early. And I don't think that it has anything to do with breastfeeding. I think it has everything to do with just how he is as a human being. (laughs) And so, you know, it wasn't that switching him to formula was going to like ruin his life. I'm a formula fed baby. My husband's a formula fed baby. We're both great adults. Like (laughs) it just, it doesn't mean anything. I just want to reiterate that for anybody who might be in that same boat right now. But again, only good things happened as a result of me making that decision to quit nursing and switch to formula. And now my son is one year old. He's happy. He's so healthy and strong. And now he's drinking whole milk and eating food that fell on the floor. Like we we just, it, all toddlers are going to end up doing the same thing regardless of um, the path that you take, right? So another thing that I thought about quitting is my business. So I reached out to that same friend in February and I said, I think I need to quit my business. And if you listen to part one, that was when I was having really, really dark thoughts about not wanting to be here anymore. And I thought that maybe my business was a big source of stress that I could eliminate. And so I was asking myself, 
am I holding on to the business because this identity of entrepreneur or business owner is more important to me than being stressed out all the time? Like, am I getting all of my validation from the fact that I'm a business owner? And she talked me off that ledge um, as a spoiler alert. Obviously, I did not quit my business in February because it's October and we're, we're still here. And around that time, there were some really prominent business owners who were closing up shop. Vanessa Lau was a really big Instagram, social media um, guru, coach, uh, business coach, and she ended up quitting her business and announcing that in February that she was shutting it all down because of the pressure and the stress of it all. Um, and I think there were a couple of other businesses that were closing up around the same time. So it gave me a lot to think about. I was kind of looking at those as like, are these signs from the universe that it's time for me to close up shop as well? And again, in part one, I talked about how there were a lot of cracks in the foundation of my business. And instead of quitting my business, I decided to tackle those and figure out like how can I change those around and that's what a lot of Q4 is about in terms of goals for me and another big part probably the biggest part and I can even add to this since I wrote this script is I was tying the success quote-unquote success of my business to my identity as a person and I felt that if I wasn't on the path to growing a massive agency, to doubling my revenue year over year, growing this huge following on social media, then my business was not legitimate enough. And if my business wasn't legit, then I'm not legit. And I started to treat my business as something that I do and not who I am. Once I realized that I had this big identity problem <laughs> with my business and I stopped working late nights, I stopped putting pressure on myself to make a ton of sales and I released myself of the pressure to be everything to my clients all the time. And right around the time that I started making those mindset shifts, my son got really sick and that really put things into perspective for me. So I did have to work some late nights in the hospital to hit deadlines um, because that's who I am. I want to do right by our clients, but I did call on the people in my corner to help me out and I forgave myself for veering from my processes and falling behind in some projects so that I could be present for my son. My priorities completely shifted and they should have shifted when my son was born. Um, but in a lot of ways, they honestly didn't. It, it took me shifting my identity and not tying so much of it to my business to actually make those uh, significant shifts. I also want to re or really stress that Nobody gave me shit for this. <laughs> I think we tell ourselves these stories that if we make those shifts and if we actually set those boundaries and we call on people to help us and we ask for help and we say, hey, this is what's happening in my life. I'm going to hand this project for this week over to this person. She's going to take care of you. Even if, even for my clients who are like, we don't want anybody else touching the business except for you, they were like, we totally understand. These are extenuating circumstances. Thank you for doing what you can to make sure that it still gets done. My clients were so kind and understanding. When I asked for help, people helped me. They, they did what they could to help me and that meant the whole world to me. My clients forgave missed deadlines. My business didn't collapse. Everything worked out and for the first time, instead of moving that with a ton of stress and pressure on my back, I moved through that season with a lot of peace that this was a temporary situation, that it meant nothing about me as a person, and that I was shifting my priorities when my family needed me more than my business did. And that was, it sounds like it shouldn't be a hard thing to do. It sounds like the most human thing to do, but it felt almost impossible until it was the only option and when it was like, is my son breathing? Yes. Okay, great. Everything else is just <laughs> icing on the cake. And so another thing that has come with that identity shift as well is when my husband and I used to talk about my business, I would be very, very protective of 
his or over his feedback. Like I wouldn't want to hear any constructive criticism from him about it because it felt like he was commenting on me instead of my business when he was literally just giving me ideas for my business. And we've been able to have really fun and exciting conversations about my business over the last few months and about all the new things that I want to do in 2024 and how I want to, you know, grow Adam's role in the business all of those things that him and I are talking about, my husband and I, and I'm like, this is so fun because it doesn't feel like I'm talking about how I could be better. I'm talking about how my business can be better. And that has helped our marriage a lot. Um, I think it's it's just overall helped me see the business in a different way. Um, and that's been kind of an unintended positive um, result of that identity shift as well. Growing my team is another goal that I've let go of this year. Um, so right now I'm down to one team member, which is a lot more manageable than the four people that I was managing uh, eight months ago. And I spent the early summer months talking with freelancers, trying to fill in the roles that I knew that we were losing or that we didn't have filled anymore. And when I was looking at our books, I realized that we didn't really have the numbers to make another team member work while continuing to pay myself. And with all the medical bills that <laughs> my son and my dog collectively have acquired this year, we need all of the uh, income that we can get. So it wasn't worth it in this season to give up my salary in order to pay another person. And managing a team can be really, really challenging. And it's definitely challenged how I look at leadership as a whole, how I, you know, envision a future team growing and building. And with only one person to manage, I can really pour into this one person and grow his role instead of trying to find more people that I then have to train and learn to trust and manage. And so everything you hear about agencies is growing, growing, growing. If you're not growing, you're going. That's like the big saying, right? But that is not always the best route. And that's not to say that I'll never bring on more people. I would love to have, you know, a bigger team in the future. But right now, this season, which is temporary, that's not the right next step for me. So that is something that I ended up quitting this year was growing and adding more people to my team. And as a last note, Nava Studios is still going strong. Uh, we're on the upswing. We signed on two amazing new clients this summer. And so again, everything works out in time. That was with me doing no sales, literally just existing on the internet. And people found us in Google search and then connected with us through other people. And now we have these two great clients on our roster um, in addition to the, you know, the existing roster that we had before. And that was, again, affirming that when I made that decision, okay, this is not the season for growth. This is just the season for maintaining. People still came to me and still tapped on my shoulder and said, hey, I see this work you're doing and I want to be a part of it. And everything just tends to work out in time. Another big thing that I quit this year was a victim mentality or a why me mentality. And this is a really hard thing to break out of and a bad and a hard pattern to break. But when you are in a tough season, it's really easy to get stuck in a why me mentality. When I talk to people, people are like, man, I feel like every time I talk to you, there's like another huge thing that you're like going through and like you guys can't catch a break this year and stuff like that. And I'm like, I know <laughs> it's been a really hard year. And it's okay to feel shitty when you're having a rough time, but getting stuck there can cause a lot more misery than what's needed. So absolutely take a day or a week to feel all your feelings, get all of those woe is me feelings out, watch your comfort shows, stay in cozy clothes, like whatever feels good to you. But then you have to shift your focus to the things that you can control. I mentioned in part one that for me, that was changing up the systems in our home, finding a new organization and cleaning routines, scheduling quality time with my husband, prioritizing working out at least three days a week, um, which I'm going to touch on more in part three. But when your intention, attention and intention is on the things that you can control, then when things happen that are out of your control, it rolls off your back a little bit more easily because you know that you can bounce right back. So the hits have kept on coming this summer. It's not like we stopped having crazy things keep happening to us, but I just feel like I'm managing it so much better mentally because I know that at the end of the day, focusing on the next right step will keep me moving forward. 
So I hope that this episode was helpful and I want to thank you all so much for the kind words that you've sent me over the last couple months since part one of this episode came out. It really means the world to me. Thank you for listening and for watching and for sharing your own stories with me and sharing how this episode resonated with you. I really, really appreciate that, you guys. So I will catch you in the next episode. We will get back to more podcast-focused content for the rest of the year. Um, But I hope you all have a good one, and I'll see you in the next one. That's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Written reviews are incredible, but even a quick five-star review is so helpful for our show. You can also rate us on Spotify. If you listen over there, you can give us five stars over there as well. Be sure to follow us over on Instagram and YouTube at Novice Studios CLT and share the show with a fellow podcaster to spread the word. See you next time.